Hello, guys, again. Uh, long time no see. Yeah. <laughs> Does anyone know how to let anyone, like, I'm keep pressing out to me all <laughs> five seconds? How to change that setting? I'll probably figure out in the next break. Uh, I'm still halfway converting the last session, but like once it's done, I'm gonna upload it into YouTube so like other people can uh, watch and maybe you could hack some association for the East Global Hackathon, you know. I'll wait for the next few minutes. Uh, I think next session we definitely need Nick. He will be leading the session, but oh yeah, he's already in. okay. So I'll make Nick as co-host. Are there anyone who has a lot to say or want a short slide? Uh, if that if there are anyone, I can also put you guys as a co-host uh, so that you can share slide. Uh, let me know if you have something you need to present. Yeah, I'm, I'm putting on YouTube as we speak. I'll just wait for a few more minutes. But I think this session we already got most people back. I need beer as well. Okay, I think we are good to go. Uh, so the second session about is about DNS integration. Uh, we already have DNS integration on some of the domains like uh, XYZ, Lux, Cred, Art, and Club, but we have the idea of making it more generalized so you could do it in most of the uh, environment. So Nick, will go through what's the progress and what's the roadmap so that you and if you have any questions so like Nick can talk as much as he likes and after that like last time I think it might be good like you know if you have a question uh, just ask on the text first and if it gets too much then probably you know Nick will ask you and I elaborate then like you can just speak up uh, Nick are you ready yep okay uh, yeah. Uh, okay, right. So uh, last session turned into a bit more of a presentation session than we thought. Um, I suspect this one will be uh, more the unconference. Um, so I'll just uh, briefly go over what our current approach to DS integration is uh, and how far where we're up to so far uh, and, and what our plans are. Uh, and then sort of open the floor for discussion because the, the whole idea behind the workshop, of course, is not to, to present to you guys about what everybody's doing or what, you know, what we're proposing to do, but to actually get together and brainstorm ideas with, you know, enough people in the same room that we can, we can make progress we wouldn't make asynchronously. Um, so, as you're probably aware, ENS's approach to uh, DNS and to the sort of the global namespace in general is one of, of cooperation. And that you know we we treat ENS as part of the same global namespace as DNS, um, and the way we have supported that so far is is twofold. First of all, um, owners of existing DNS domains, um, that is top level domains, uh, can request ownership of that domain inside ENS, uh, and once they have that, they can issue subdomains as they see fit. Uh, so we've already seen that happen with a number of. Uh, top level domain owners, including uh, .lux, who was the first and, and built a bespoke integration, um, .cred, .art, uh, and so forth. Um, the second approach is that 
uh, we are building a generic bridge between DNS and ENS um, and uh, using something we call the DNSSEC Oracle. Um, DNS, as you're again probably aware, uh, has uh, a built-in security mechanism called DNSSEC, uh, which relies on signing uh, records in DNS using keys that form a chain of trust all the way out to the DNS route. And it turns out that fortunately, uh, this is fairly easy to uh, to implement on the EVM. Um, it's actually possible for us to verify DNSSEC proofs on the EVM, and therefore you can cryptographically prove that uh, you have ownership of a domain on DNS and that therefore you should get ownership of the equivalent domain on ENS. Uh, Hadrian's asking how TLD owners are reacting to gas price. Uh, so far there hasn't been much reaction, largely because I think the most of the integrations are either relatively low volume in that users tend to set an address once um, per domain um, or that they are uh, still in an experimental stage. Um, the current, uh, currently the, the integration is deployed only on .xyz, um, but our goal is to roll it out uh, first to all supported TLDs and then to all supported domains in general. Um, we're pretty close to being able to release that for TLDs. Um, there are a few minor bugs and issues in the existing in uh, integration that we want to resolve before rolling it out. Uh, for instance, making sure that if a user, uh, if their domain expires, then a proof that the domain no longer exists at the higher level can be used to, to eliminate that domain from ENS, whereas presently it would require, uh, with the .xyz integration, it would require someone else to buy the domain before it got uh, removed from, uh, DN from ENS. Um, once that's done, we can deploy it to basically all TLDs that support the, the relevant uh, infrastructure. Not every TLD supports uh, DNSSEC or the algorithm we use. Um, and then things get a bit more complicated from there because uh, top level domain is not exactly the same concept as public suffix. And public suffix basically means a domain that uh, anyone can register subdomains of. Um, and so the most obvious example is country code domains where you have .co.nz, .co.uk, .com.au and so forth, where the second level domain is com or co or org and so forth, and it's actually the third level domain people are registering. Um, but there are many more complex examples than that, and in fact there is a list, uh, a public suffix list, publicsuffix.org, uh, which maintains a catalogue of some if I remember correctly, uh, approximately 6,000 entries uh, that describes what domains are and aren't public suffixes. Um, supporting this on ENS is, is, would be difficult. Uh, so as a stage one, we're just going to roll out to TLDs and then go from there on trying to enable the, the highest impact public suffixes and then hopefully eventually any that want to uh, work. Um, so that is the the immediate roadmap. Um, what I'm interested to hear from everyone is uh, whether you think we're headed in the right direction, um, what you'd like to see us uh, focus on, um, and if there are any things we can do here that would make uh, ENS's integration with the DNS world either more effective, more efficient, um, and so forth. Uh, something else I can go over later in the discussion is also our attempts to reduce the cost of all of this uh, via something akin to an optimistic roll-up uh, in order to, to account for raising, rising gas prices and, and decreasing block space on Ethereum. So uh, first of all, I guess any feedback on, on what I've said so far, we'd like to hear from you with how it's going, whether it's useful to you, what you'd like to see change. Um, so there's uh, Richard, Rick asks, uh, timelines. Um, there's been uh, both technical and non-technical holdups. Uh, although the, crypt the cryptography is relatively straightforward, it makes for a fairly complicated set of smart contracts and uh, can be difficult uh, with the current state of uh, Ethereum EVM infrastructure for debugging to figure out exactly why something's failing. Um, we're mostly past all of that and you know the remaining bugs are, are uh, fairly straightforward, you know, we need a change in behavior rather than we're trying to debug a weird signing issue. 
Um, there have also been non-technical interruptions in the form of my daughter being born and me being the main person who's working on this. Um, but uh, with all of that, I think we can expect to roll out DNSSEC to all DNS top level domains uh, probably in the next month or so, assuming that the key holders agree and that uh, the code looks good. Um, James Montgomery says, uh, SHA-256 hashing prevents support with Namecheap and other registrars. Uh, any changes planned here to support additional registrars? So we support SHA-1 and SHA-256. Um, SHA-1 is obviously deprecated. Is there, an, uh, uh, there are other hashing algorithms supported, um, but uh, none that I'm aware of uh, that are widely deployed. What are, can you tell us what Namecheap's using? Um, and Hadrian says, uh, what's the expected use case from DNS owners moving to ENS? Um, the general idea is that uh, if you want to use ENS, you shouldn't need to register a .eth domain unless you want to. The selling, the selling point, the key advantage of ENS is that you can in, ensure ownership of it cryptographically. But our primary goal is just to let people name resources in a decentralized fashion. And so if you own an existing domain, you can make that your payment address, you can make that your IPFS handle and so forth. Uh, we don't see any reason that these should be, should have to be separate systems. Uh, are other people getting issues with my audio as well? Yes. It's better than that. All right, uh, I'll try it without video and see if it works any better. Um, is this any better? It's okay. Uh, is it an improvement over over with video? I think it's slight improvements. Okay. Um, uh, Thibaut asks about uh, disconnect between uh, ENS and DNS. Um, it's it's difficult uh, in the case where the same resource can be resolved using two different systems. Uh, so, for instance, uh, cryptographic addresses can only be resolved using ENS, um, and so it's, you don't have this issue. Um, generally, you could set your name up in a way that would confusingly give different results uh, for the two, uh, you know, depending on which system you use to resolve it. Um, I would consider that a misconfiguration and that you should, you know, that, that you need to, to fix it so that there is only one authoritative source of, of information. Um, E.g. if you have a CID record in DNS, then you either need to mirror it across or delete it on ENS, or you need to host your domain uh, using uh, DNS link, uh, sorry, using uh, DNS over ENS uh, so that you know, our servers serve up your DNS as well. Um, you know, there's similar misconfigurations are possible with other protocols, and I think that's probably the best way to look at it. Just okay. Uh, so we should dig into what Namecheap's doing. Um, one issue we had previously is that uh, so there's there's two main uh, there's several uh, public key crypto schemes supported by DNSSEC, um, but only two that are widely deployed. One is RSA and one is P uh, SEC P two fifty six. Uh, R1, not K1, as used by uh, Ethereum. Um, the former is very easy to support because there is an RSA precompile on Ethereum, and it lets us verify signatures in about 100,000 gas per uh, per element, um, which is very, uh, you know, which is not ideal, but is is pretty good. Um, the other P256 is not supported on Ethereum as a precompile. And as a result, uh, initially we didn't support it at all, and that may have been the cause of the, the lack of uh, name cheap support in general. Um, but it's becoming more and more widely deployed because the signatures are significantly more compact than RSA. Um, and so we, uh, Dean Eigenman in particular, spent a bit of effort on implementing a user layer uh, or EVM layer uh, support for verifying P2P6 signatures and used an existing project for this. 
Uh, so we're now able to support those. Uh, it's not yet deployed on mainnet, but it is deployed on Ropstad. Um, the problem with this is it costs about a million gas per signature. Um, and so I guess this is a good um, uh, this is a good uh, time to talk about uh, gas saving and roll up type efforts. Um, a million gas per per verification is obviously rather on the high side, and I would say impractical for most users to uh, to handle, um, given the current cost of gas and ether, uh, and the fact that we only expect it to get worse over time. Um, we have sort of two options here, three, I guess. Uh, one is we could work on improving the efficiency of the P26 uh, algorithm. It's difficult, however, to find cryptographers who understand ECDSA and the EVM intimate, intimately and have spare time, the latter being the most difficult to find. Um, the second is that we could campaign for inclusion of a P256 precompile into Ethereum, uh, which I think is potentially a good idea, but is also a lengthy and, and difficult one. Um, and the third is that we can find some way to remove this signature val validation overhead uh, entirely. Um, and that last one is the one we've been exploring recently. Um, and so the, uh, the proposal we put out a little while ago is a fairly straightforward one around, it's kind of a roll up, it's kind of, it's optimistic and it's kind of a roll up. Um, the basic idea would be that um, you have a contract that is capable of updating records in, in ENS, uh, so it replaces the current DNS set registrar. Um, and the way it works is that anyone can uh, uh, can connect to it and can uh, become a bonded uh, attester. Uh, and that attester puts down a large deposit um, and then... Uh, Sorry, it's uh, it's about 6 a.m. So my brain is about 80% functional. Um, so anyone can connect, uh, can put down a large deposit to become an attester, and an attester can simply assert that a, a given signature uh, is valid by posting the signature to the chain along with the DNS records it signs, and the contract will assume that they're correct and update the the corresponding record in ENS. So it basically uh, does what the current DNS sec uh, registrar does only without actually bothering to verify the signatures. Um, but it logs the signatures of the chain and watchers can keep an eye out for those uh, signatures, can validate them off chain, which is you know relatively cheap uh, for all that it costs a lot of gas. Um, and if they verify that an attester has attested a signature that's invalid, they can send in uh, a transaction which asks the contract to actually verify that signature, incurring the million gas or thereabouts. Uh, but if it's found that the attester attested an invalid signature, then their deposit, which can be quite substantial, is slashed. Um, the upside of this is that it reduces the cost of uh, uploading a DNS record to a fairly minimal one, uh, just the cost of the storage changes, uh, plus a, a bit of extra gas for logging the signature to the chain so that so it can be monitored. Um, the downside is that if a, an attester were to misbehave, uh, they can uh, push false records to ENS uh, within a limited scope and that they have to be the ones that can be affected by DNS proofs. Um, but that, uh, you know, that is, uh, can still be fairly harmful. Uh, in doing so, of course, they would lose their deposit, but then they might be able to, to gain some profit in the meantime. Uh, personally, I, I view that with a sufficient deposit, then that's, uh, it would be impractical for that to be profitable. And so as long as you expect people to be profit motivated, um, that's a sufficient security margin. Uh, and we can make the deposit quite large because uh, we expect that the main attesters running would be, for instance, ourselves, uh, not for profit, but running it as a public service in order to make this more efficient. Um, and should that go down, the old method of, of actually just manually verifying stuff is still available. Um, the alternative option is that you do a, a commit and wait type scheme where uh, you submit your request to change, it logs it, and it doesn't actually take effect until there's been a challenge period. And that guarantees pretty much that attesters can't push false records to the chain, but it slows things down because you need a challenge period. Uh, so any DNS update would take hours or, you know, perhaps as much as a day to propagate before the, the challenge period expires and it requires additional transactions. 
um, and my own view personally at, at present is that we're better with the more efficient scheme that is still unprofitable to cheat than the more involved uh, slower scheme. Um, uh, Nakoto asks if there's a, a if we can um, combine this with Vitalik's uh, roll-up type scheme. Um, in principle, yes, actually, because we could treat DNS as an L2 effectively. Um, the difference, I guess, is that Vitalik's L2 scheme doesn't uh, is about uh, Vitalik's L2 scheme assumes that none of this ever gets pushed to L1, so it's about reads and challenges and so forth. But you could uh, you could basically say yeah, DNS is an L is an L2, um, and we're going to um, we're going to treat it like one. We're going to have a testers that can attest things about DNS records, and we're going to do the resolution off chain. We're never going to push these records to chain in the first place. The challenge here would be that we don't currently have any infrastructure for hosting. It would effectively mean you needed to host your ENS records on in DNS records, um, because presently the the idea is that once you claim ownership of a DNS name, you then put ENS records on it inside ENS. If you were doing this, then what you would actually be doing is e ENS resolvers could resolve DNS, basically, and we'd need to have ways to encode all of our ENS records inside DNS messages. Um, but it's definitely something worth exploring, and it's not something I'd previously considered. Um, uh, Rick, Richard Moore asks, uh, talks about verification inside ZK Snarks. Um, I'm not 100% sure. Um, I'm, I'm not sure that P256 is Snark friendly, um, but I am not a Snark cryptographer, uh, so I'm not terribly familiar with the, the parameters of that. Rick, do you want to join in it? Just have a conversation? Like, sounds like yeah, please do. I, I need to finish my coffee. <laughs> oh, I mean, I don't have much else to say. I just like the offline like chatting so I don't have to interrupt while people are talking. It's just random ideas, I thought. I was wondering, like, it seems like you should be able to do anything in a snark. So if you could, I mean, it might take four days for them to compute the proof, but it would be nice that once you have that proof, you could put on chain and it could update all those like ENS records, um, basically being pre-verified. But again, I haven't done the tutorial yet. I don't know enough about snarks either. They just seem kind of magic. I, my very, um, my very uh, low knowledge understanding of snarks is that um, it's difficult for them to compute things that aren't uh, designed for the the snark effectively. You know, they 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 do math in a particular field. Um, so generally, what they've done is they've picked uh, curves and signature schemes that are matched to the snark and can therefore be efficiently computed in there, and that. Uh, I don't think there is a snark scheme that matches up with P256 so that it's efficient to, to compute. Uh, but uh, again, I could be quite mistaken. Right. Uh, in no, terms of what... Which... Like... Oh, sorry? No, no, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, like, once I've done a few tutorials, I'll have a better idea. I was almost thinking, though, of throwing away the efficiency part. Like, maybe it can be really slow in a snark, but it's still, it's still fixed cost. But... I don't know how hard these things are to do either. Yeah, yeah, I'm not sure. Um, yeah, actually, Adrian also points out that the chat of D6 is an issue. Um, the I know that you can have recursive snarks, which you know, suppose, uh, hypothetically permit arbitrary computations, but I think that yeah, it could be a significant issue with with actually being practical to do. Um, uh, Ulrich uh, asks which TLDs we plan to support. Um, the the short answer is all of them as long as they enable DNSSEC and they use either SHA-1 or SHA-256 for the hashing algorithm and either um, uh, P256 or RSA for the signature scheme, um, which in practical terms is about, I think, 90 to 95% of all top-level domains at present. Okay. Then I have a follow-up question. Would people need to register their domains on, on chain? 
so pay registering so, fee? Um, so using the current scheme, um, you, you have to submit a transaction to claim it on chain, uh, but you don't have to uh, pay a registration fee other than just the transaction fee for mining the transaction. Um, and we have no plans to, to charge for this because in our mind, um, the reason .eth charges a fee is because if we didn't, it would be overwhelmed by people just squatting on every single domain and trying to resell it. Basically, the entire surplus, and being the, the difference between the cost of the domain and, and the value of the domain, would be absorbed by squatters, and the system would be, you know, mired in, in effectively illiquidity. Um, no such issue exists with DNS because it's already regulated by another system. So an ENS, like the organisation, doesn't exist to extract profit from the ENS the system. Uh, so there's no reason we would charge for it, basically. Uh, and so it's, it's intended that if you have a DNS domain, you can claim it on ENS as cheaply as possible. And how could we um, as a CCTLD make sure that an expired domain vanishes from the chain? Uh, so with the changes we're about to make before deploying uh, this more widely, uh, all you need to do is ensure that your root zone is signed and that it can produce an NSEC or an NSEC3 proof for domains that are no longer registered. Um, and then uh, you or anyone else will be able to submit that uh, that record as proof the domain is deleted and that will eliminate the domain from any NS. Is kind of impractical. Which bit? <laughs> uh, so, uh, like eighty percent of all expired domains get snapped back. So, get yes. re registered re at the time of expiring. Yeah. By somebody um, else. By yes. Basically. So that. If that person has DNSSEC enabled, then we'll also be able to produce a, a negative proof for the, the subdomain, you know, underscore ENS, because it will no longer exist, and so we can remove it then. Um, if they have DNSSEC disabled, um, that is something on my to-do list to dig through the RFCs again. Uh, perhaps you can tell me, actually. Uh, I, I assume from my, my vague recollection that if a if you delegate to a domain, if you're, you have a DNS stick signed domain that delegates to another domain, a subdomain, um, but does not have DNS stick enabled, then you cannot produce an NSEC3 proof that says this subdomain does not exist. You simply can't produce a proof. Is that correct? That depends on it. So NSEC can produce a proof, NSEC3 can produce a proof in case you don't use opt out. But most yes. DLDs do right. use opt out. Yep. So the issue there is um, either we will have to have some way to detect opt out and say, okay, this domain no longer exists with DNS with a DNS six sign proof. Um, and if it's possible for us to do that, then we can delete it. If it's not possible for us to do that, then the domain simply remains in the state it was until either uh, the new owner sets up DNS six, so we can prove that it, the subdomain no longer exists, or there is no owner and therefore the root domain can prove that the, the subdomain doesn't exist. Um, so uh, Jonathan says, uh, oh sorry, uh, Ethereum say, uh, is the optimistic game for registering the original DNS name also uh, just for the original name or also for subdomains? Um, the idea here is that you register the the public suffix, or sorry, the domain under the public suffix, so argent.xyz, and then everything under that you manage inside ENS uh, if you want it to be, you know, for, for ENS relevant records. Um, this does raise an interesting uh, issue that we went back and forth on, which would be uh, a simpler way to manage um, uh, to manage uh, DNS inside ENS, rather than explicitly uploading the public suffix list to Ethereum and having to maintain that, uh, would be to simply say that uh, the DNSSEC Oracle is capable of claiming any domain uh, as long as none of the parent domains are owned, which means that uh, anybody could uh, could say, oh, I have, uh, you know, nick.appspot.com, for instance, and although appspot.com is owned by Google, as long as they haven't claimed uh, that domain inside ENS, 
then I could claim my personal subdomain. And so basically the management becomes at the highest level that cares to get involved. Um, the issue with this is that it could lead to some, some pretty unexpected consequences. Um, and the biggest issue is uh, given that claiming happens by you're expected to create a subdomain underscore ENS of the domain you want to claim. Um, there are almost certainly systems out there that don't prohibit users from creating subdomains that start with underscores, which means that in the worst case, uh, to take the example of appspot.com, I could register an app that is called underscore ENS, and in doing so, claim the entire unsuspecting public suffixes uh, record and, and override everyone else's. Um, and it seems difficult to ensure that uh, everybody in the world uh, correctly, you know, prevents users from registering domains that start with underscores. Um, even though, you know, failing to do that would have other issues. It would allow their users, for instance, to prove things about, um, uh, to, sorry, to claim their um, DKIM keys and so forth. Um, but I don't think we can assume that no misconfiguration ever happens. I think you can be pretty sure that any TLD, at least, is not allowing underscores in the yes, beginning of a I, th I think I think that when it comes to like GTLDs and 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 almost maybe all C CTLDs, then they're probably operated sufficiently competently. Um, but if you look at the public suffix list with you know some six thousand entries, I I have relatively little confidence that they're all operated correctly. And I'm uh, Probably the consequences of one of them being poorly configured is not terribly large, but is that a risk we want to take? The the upside would be in one fell swoop, we would just we'd enable DNS sec for everyone who wants to use it, uh, as long as the, the DNS uh, sec infrastructure is there. Uh, which is relevant to what uh, Jothan said, uh, the adoption of DNS sec across registrars is spotty. Um, the intermix of same registrar DNS and third-party DNS without a conduit to transmit records from third-party DNS to registry is a barrier. Um, short version for those who aren't admired in DNSSEC stuff is DNSSEC can be a pain to set up and particularly so if you're using your own DNS servers. Uh, and this is true and unfortunately there's very little we can do about it because in order to be able to trustlessly claim domains on DNS you know, without a, an oracle that is trusted to do DNS resolution, we need some sort of cryptographic proof and DNSSEC is kind of it. So we're just going to have to rely on improving infrastructure and rollout for that, I think. Uh, James asks, could resolvers read entries direct from DNS? Uh, potentially, but then we're kind of throwing away some of the key advantages of DNS, uh, such as the fact that you can uh, put guarantees on, on what a name resolves to and that uh, you, you know, I guess the, there are systems around like PayID which use uh, DNS and HTTPS to resolve cryptographic names, um, which is, I think, an interesting and, and worthwhile approach to try. But my concern there is the same as putting your money on, uh, on exchanges in that you are trusting a third party not to be compromised and lose your funds. And so the same issue exists there, that if somebody is compromised, then they can redirect your name to uh, their own account. Um, and the same issue would occur if you were reading entries direct from DNS. Uh, it exists to a lesser extent if you're relying on the Oracle at all, because if your DNS server is compromised, they can they can reassign your name. Um, but we're trying to sort of minimize trust here and also uh, maximize the simplicity for DNS resolvers. Um, uh, Rick Moo says, uh, points out that deregistering a domain would get you store refunds. Uh, and that therefore you could do something akin to gas token where you tag on some deregistrations to your transactions in order to, to save gas. Uh, it would be quite neat actually if we just provided a, a built-in incentive um, to do that, like more than a gas refund. Uh, you know, perhaps when you register the domain, you have to put down a, a fairly trivial deposit, um, which is then given back to whoever deregisters it when it stops existing. Um, the problem with this is uh, much the same as why storage doesn't give you, deletion doesn't give you an actual refund, which is the accounting for it's a bit of a nightmare, I think. Um, uh, 
Can you, uh, Jothan, can you expand a bit what you mean on scanning domains for key slash SIG stuff? Yeah, sure. So we've, we're struggling uh, as uh, registries, registrars working together to try to make adoption of DNSSEC more wide across the Icanosphere. Um, when, they, mm -hmm. when they set all this up, it, the, the way that DNSSEC works is kind of in harmony that the records match all the way up to the root. And there's a registration path and a resolution path. Um, and where, um, where somebody would want to set up the record and somehow get that to float up to the registry so all the signature stuff works, um, you either have to send that through your registrar through special commands that get sent up to the registry, or um, in, in some CCTLDs, they've gone through uh, and they'll scan through the records of the subordinate domains within their zones find a signature and include it in the, using just the resolution path, which works up to a scaling issue. And the, the challenge right now is, you know, VeriSign would have to scan the entirety of the .com zone to go out and find these things and get those into the signatures. Now, I realize that's a different thing than what you're discussing, but I think that the approach or method might be similar and it can represent a pretty significant overhead as far as, you know, scanning for, um, those signatures. I, I think I understood the yeah. context to what was being discussed, but that if that helps. That's it. <laughs> hey, Jothan. Um, the fact that we have this, I mean, could this even in a small way provide an incentive for better utilization of DNSSEC in your opinion? Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, uh, I mean, the challenge with DNSSEC is that it's harder than, you know, the regular stuff. And uh, DNS, uh, DNSSEC is very like rocket science for people. The general consumer kind of wants to just you know, come in, set their stuff up. I would say when you get into DNSSEC, you're more in the realm of the power user. Some registrars have found a way to make it a little more accessible to, to people, but it typically, the, the way that they go about doing that is where they're offering some kind of um, service that they can activate the DNSSEC and manage the DNSSEC in a controlled set of name servers. The, the problematic area is where people go to third party uh, name servers that are hosted elsewhere. When the registrar controls the whole ecosphere, then it works really well. And it's, it's kind of an arch architectural hurdle, uh, you know, that didn't envision the shared registry system as it is when DNSSEC was conceived. Um, and so getting past that, anything that drives consumer interest, consumer requests and requirements is great. The value that uh, you know being able to layer uh, wallet naming systems is new value that domains get introduced to them. So as as a market force, the belief is, and, and one of the reasons I embrace you know ENS domains is that uh, the more things that can be built on top of a stable structure of DNSSEC, the more value is there, and that's going to create a kind of an attraction to people to overcome these um, challenges. And registrars as a marketplace are always looking for things to either differentiate themselves or, or, or make uh, more money, you know, commercially. So if, if that person buys a domain and they've got stuff layered on top of it, whether it's hosting or email or a wallet address or, you know, smart contracts or, um, you know, tokens, that's the, the belief is that that's going to be good for a registrar. And, and we see some registrars that have done this. Uh, pork bun is a great example. I think uh, in Circa, um, there's a few other registrars that have taken and kind of embraced this. Uh, but it gets challenging because uh, the moment somebody goes and hosts their DNS somewhere else, you have a very difficult out of band manual process of establishing these these records. And when keys roll and things like that, it it, it is more challenging. And so nobody has created the NASA NASCAR rain, rainbow bridge to um, make that easier. It's being discussed, but there's no standard for it. And there's, there's even some commercial forces that work against it right now inside of the, uh, the registry registrar space. 
I took the long way around the barn to say, yeah, probably. Well, at the registry, we have the 50% of the domain signed. <laughs> I can say there's ways to do this, but mm -hmm. as you said, it's uh, usually the domains that get that are handled by the registrars that are signed. Sure, uh, but do you scan your zone and look for the uh, in third party, or you don't care if it's a third party name server? So do you go find yet, the signature? The the okay. Yes. Yeah, and so I know, like. Um, I think CZNIC does, and there's yes. another. Check, check and the Swiss. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so um, Switch and uh, yeah. CZNIC do this. Yes. Are you with, uh, do you work with the SE yes. registry? Okay. Yes. yes. Very good, very good. Yeah, so the, with a CCTLD too, you've got, um, uh, you can have different integration of the, the um, business models inside of GTLDs, they created um, sort of competitive structure. So there is a concept of a registry and the registry, um, you know, creates the zone and does all the sort of central database uh, for the TLD and then registrars um, typically sent the separate entity um, manage the interaction with the customer or more B2C and they have a B2B relationship um, programmatically through a secure system back to the registry. And it's designed that way. Um, and that's, that's it, it all kind of works that way with few exceptions. We're starting to see more vertical integration of those two models, like um, GoDaddy bought uh, Newstar and their registry and uh, Affilius uh, who run .info um, own uh, a registrar or two and CentralNIC owns a variety of registrars. Um, so, so we're starting to see that model uh, experience some vertical integration that still doesn't solve the third party name server stuff. Um, Cloudflare, you know, as a DNS provider, uh, you know, they have accredited and they transfer names at cost to work with their system for their customers. So another interesting market force is that's working a little bit against this is that the DNS providers don't pay into the fees inside of the ICANN structure. Um, and they also might, um, you know, in the case of, of Cloudflare, you've got a perfect example of where somebody would slam your customers as a registrar. So there's market forces um, that uh, are creating resistance. So there's some business things, there's some, technical difficulty versus, you know, can I make this much money here versus this much money to implement something else? And DNSSEC is on the difficulty curve is very high. If you have an old system, yes. If you have a, True. a Absolutely. modern name server, it is basically just an on switch. To God's ears. So, <laughs> since, since you, you, since we have you here, let me ask. Um, one of the issues I think with uh, with this with the disconnect between registrars and, and service providers for DNS is that DNS set keys tend to get rotated a lot more often, which means it's a lot more important to uh, to have that connection to keep the the glue intact and up to date. Um, is there a reason like the DNS keys aren't simply rotated on a comparable schedule to, to SSL, the uh, TLS keys? Uh, is that for Ulrich or me or? Uh, there is a reason. Rotating Either keys is, Rotating keys is an, so the, I mean, DNSSEC has two kind of keys, right? The KSK and the ZSK. And the KSK, the key signing key is the one that is get referred from the parent zone. And to rotate the key signing key is a major pain because that is the one where you need to contact the parent. And usually you don't have an automated path into the parent. That means manual interaction. And how many people do you know that can do a manual key update somewhere? Right, uh, the, but I guess- So my... that, that, that's uh, the, uh, <laughs> the essence of what is so problematic with DNSSEC. Yes, but I guess my question is why are we rotating the KSK 
often enough that this is an issue. Um, you know, you, you have an, a similar issue with uh, in needing a new, a new TLS certificate and having to update it to all of your service software, but we make this infrequent enough that many people, I think, do this with manual action rather than an automated system. Yeah, but for, for TLS, we started to do this when we, we got Let's Encrypt and we can automate it. But there is no way to automate it for the NSEC, at least not right now. The, the, I, I, I did send the link there to the CDS, CDNS, key RFC. And I mean, that is a way of doing that, that the, the, in our case, it would be the registry scanning domains and see if there's changes to the key set and then updating the, the information in the registry. And that would automate all that. And that would obviously be make it much easier for everybody to, you know, run the NSF. Um, but there's but there's still other problems that are unsolved. Like let's say you want to change providers, so you have to change registrar, you, or you, you change your name server operator. Then you, you you need to change keys, and even CDNS key doesn't help you with that because now you suddenly have to cross sign keys. Um, and I mean, I know how to do that, but uh, there's not many people, not even in the DNS world who can do that. So, so there's still um, <laughs> work to be done to make this really an, an, an immersive experience that just works. It's true. And people don't know, like in your browser, when you see the little lock show up as a visual indication that you've got some sort of a, uh, you know, so secure encryption going on with the information you're transmitting, DNSSEC has no type of indication visually. So consumers don't even know if they've got it. And even still, there's varying degrees of how much it might exist between what you're doing as a user and, um, and the actual resolution process. It's all opaque, it's all abstracted for the customer. So there's no way to say, you know, create that visual indication of a demand like you did with secure certificates and PKI infrastructure. So the, uh, if I can summarize for, the, for those uh, who aren't very deeply in DNS infrastructure, uh, DNS tech is difficult and uh, adoption is low and that will hopefully change, but not quickly. Is that seem fair to both of you? Yep. Um, and so, so that's a barrier to, to practical use of DNS on the NS as well, because you know we're, we're strictly dependent on deployment of, of DNS infrastructure. And the fortunate thing is that most users today, if they're determined enough, can probably get the set up, but it's, it's far from user friendly. And just maybe as, a, as an add-on to that, Nick, that the attraction of being able to leverage your domain name as a wallet address to give out is a carrot. It's an attractive, uh, you know, an alluring reason that would motivate people to go through the steps, even if they're manual, to do them. Yeah. Yep. Uh, just to add so that's a good to point. that, uh, I had a conversation with someone who is in in charge of like a UK domain or something. And one of the stuff they were very interested in this DNS integration itself is not just, not only because you can now have a, a cryptocurrency address attached to the domain, but also you can use it as a, a kind of PKI, you know, public key signing infra infrastructure. So even, even if you don't deal with cryptocurrency for the signing capability, which is proven by the domain itself could be actually uh, quite appealing for uh, more enterprise who who's nothing to do with crypto. Maybe if we can kind mm -hmm. of publish, you know, promote that idea, it could be kind of care up for more like you know traditional enterprises. Yep. And and in a sense, ENS ENS DNS integration itself is an example of that. You know, of us leveraging DNS's infrastructure for for other things. Um. So, uh, yes, and the public, uh, thank you for the link to the public suffix list, which we uh, will be relying on at least somewhat to, to going forward uh, with our deployment. Uh, although, as I mentioned initially, it will be uh, top level domains only. Um, 
that brings us to, to 10 2. So uh, I think we should probably wrap up to give everyone a chance to grab a cup of tea and so forth before the next session. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, guys.